Here I go walking up the steps that I couldn't walk up before. I gotta watch myself. I might fall over if I don't watch. I literally could not walk up these steps five months ago. It was almost impossible. deep breath. This is going to be like really relaxed. Okay. All right. Well, um, DJ is with a great program known as Get Real and Heal. I'll let you talk more about that. But the reason why I have DJ on this podcast today, and he doesn't even know, he actually, you actually, not just the program, but you yourself actually put me in a different mindset after cancer. You remember when I used to come to the program, I could barely walk up that that yeah. monster hill. I do remember. And yeah. down that hill. And my husband told me I needed to do something. Yeah. And I said, I heard of this program. I want to go. But every time I went in there, you were always positive. I didn't feel like I had cancer, even though everybody around me. So you were actually a very positive light. You actually got me to walking, walking again, actually, because I barely could walk. Um, I could barely breathe. I could do any, like everything cancer had taken away from me. And you actually gave that back to me. You talked to me, not just about what was going on, but you talked to me about my life. And well, man, <laughs> okay. I was not expecting that. Okay. A little warning would have been, <laughs> would have been nice for that. But yeah. um, you, well, thank you. <laughs> amazing. Like my husband always asks, how's DJ doing? And I'm like, he's doing great because he made me great again. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that is so nice to hear. And then, Hey, you did it yourself when you took off on the spin classes, then you went off on your own. And oh, I was a monster. I had nothing I to was, do with that. I was a beast when that happened. <laughs> so, yeah. t- so tell me, introduce yourself. And I have moved my mic. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. So I'm DJ Amatuli. I am one of the senior trainers at Get Real and Heal. I've been there since April of 2009. So mm-hmm. By the time I graduate next year, it'll be about 11 years. Wow. I'm currently in my second of two years in the master's program at UNC Chapel Hill for exercise physiology, Mm -hmm. uh, specifically focusing on cancer and exercise or exercise oncology, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And um, I've seen our program change a lot over the years when I first started there and in 2009, I was just showing up to get some volunteer hours because I thought uh-huh. I wanted to go to physical therapy school. And I went in there and it was so different. It was like a one-on-one situation. There would be one participant, one mm-hmm. trainer, that person would get done exercising, the next person would come in. And as the years went on and the program started to get a little bit more popular, we realized we weren't serving the amount of people that we really felt we could. Yeah. So we made a transition in about 2013, mm-hmm. I think it was. I remember that. To the group format. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of took off from there. Now we probably see between 90 and 100 visits a week. Wow. Um, we've served well into the thousands between people who come into the facility And outreach programs that we do as well, Mm -hmm. uh, including a little stint doing some telehealth things. Uh And um, now it's been almost 11 years and I never went to PT school and I've been at Get Real and Heal (laughs) ever since. So, yeah. Well, what brought you, I always say, what brings you to the glow? What brings you to that chemo glow? Why your interest in cancer? Man, that it's interesting kind of going back to that story is like, when I showed up, I didn't really have one, uh-huh. uh, or not even that I didn't have one. I had just never had an experience with it. I, oh. I guess in a way I was lucky enough never to have anyone close to me who, mm-hmm. who had cancer. And, um, when I showed up, I, I was, I was there because I was in my second semester of my senior year and uh-huh. 
I finished all of my requirements that I needed to graduate. So I just started like taking some electives and that's when I took a class with Dr. Badalini. Mm-hmm. Dr. Um, B, we love Dr. Him. B as we call him. <laughs> yes. And he, um, he, who is the director of the get real and heal program. And now he's also my mentor, academic advisor in the master's program told me that, you know, as I'm getting my applications together for PT school, Mm -hmm. maybe I should try and add some, some different volunteer hours. I had done some volunteering at various PT clinics. Uh Um, and I'm not sure if I specified, but PT is physical therapy. Sorry. There you go. Um, and I was doing that and he told me that I should check out get real and heal because it would be something different that kind of stuck out a little bit on a resume. So I showed up one day, just, I get, I was a little hesitant. I didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was on my way to a soccer game that I was playing in that night. And I was like, okay, I'll go to this interest meeting for like a half hour. Mm-hmm. So I showed up and there's about five people there and we talked about the program. He convinced me to come back one day And I showed up that first day and I remember I was shadowing him and then shadowing a couple of other uh, student trainers who were there and just sort of fell in love with it. And I think I, it was more, it was less the training aspect and falling in love with like the kind of person that you were training. It was, I mean, the job itself is so easy. You're working with the most grateful people in the world. Mm -hmm. It's, it's pretty easy. In fact, like, I would say if you ask most people in the program, it's almost like exercise is kind of secondary. It is secondary. It's like a community because when is. I actually um, got there, I was like in very bad shape. Yeah. And um, I was looking at someone who was doing crunches and I was like, I can't even sit up. Yeah. I was like, but I'm going to be there. And you kept saying you'll get there because I would look and be like, well, how am I going to do a freaking crunch and I can't even walk or whatever. But I'm surprised that you just came to the program with no attachment to Mm -mm. to cancer. None. Because you did so well. And I think I'm going to end up turning that off. You did so um, well with connecting. How do you connect? Because you connect with me like, I thought like I'm going back for DJ and then I met Jean and I was like, I'm going back for them. It wasn't necessarily the exercise because I couldn't do that at first. Well, I think part of it is that especially following, you know, going through treatment and stuff, people just, I guess they think they really want someone who's looking out for them. And I really think that was the big change when we went to the community based Mm -hmm. um, or to the group based exercise in this community oriented um, programmatic landscape is that we wanted to provide something that they weren't getting. And I think the big complaint that we had from people when it was the one-on-one was that I'm exercising and I feel a lot better, but I haven't met a single person yeah. who's going through what I'm going through. And even by like 2012, I had been doing it for three years and I felt like I could provide a lot of guidance. Uh-huh. However, at that time we were purely, um, it was purely a breast cancer program. We mm-hmm. hadn't expanded. And for as much as I knew as a 25 year old male at mm-hmm. the time, there wasn't a ton of insight I could give into personal experience with dealing with breast cancer Mm -hmm. or dealing with treatment or even like when it would come down to making the decision of, do I do reconstruction or not? Yeah. Um, So I could tell people like, this is what I've heard from other people, Mm -hmm. but I can't give you the perspective that I think you really need. So when we community made that, yeah, happen. exactly. Yeah. Which is, it's kind of funny when we, when we started the community based thing, we even wanted to do like two sections. It was going to be exercise and there was going to be a group therapy session once a week. And we quickly disbanded that because what we realized was with the group exercise, uh-huh. those conversations were coming up and getting resolved organically That was therapy. Yeah, exactly. So then when we sat people in a circle trying to do these therapy sessions, everyone was sort of like, well, we kind of already talked this out. Yeah. Um, 
And it felt a little bit forced. Too. And it wasn't honest. No, but right. If we were on the elliptical or somebody was on the treadmill and someone was talking about, well, I had my breast removed in this time and that time. And mm-hmm. we all just chimed yeah. in. It was a safe space. It was a safe space. And the fact that you were the only guy there, yeah. like you was the only dude in the room. I learned a lot. You learned a lot. <laughs> but your facial expression was like, okay, and we're moving on. Yeah. All right. That changed. <laughs> yeah. Now you can throw anything at me. And yeah, I, I've heard it all at this point. And Everything. And you have women who are coming in there like exposed. Yeah. You know, I have, uh, you know, I, that was one of the places that I didn't wear my breast form. Right. I was comfortable enough to come in there and not bring Bonnie or Flash yeah. <laughs> or whatever I named them at the time. And you see the same thing with wigs and wigs, stuff. That's the one place yeah. people feel like they can take it off. And even and, so, even sometimes people come in and they're wearing their wig for maybe the first week. Yeah. And then by week two, they're like, screw it. Yeah. I, I don't need to put this on here. And I, that's like the thing that I like the most is this is finally where people can feel like they can relax a little bit mm-hmm. there surrounded by people who understand what they've gone through Uh and what they're going through. And I think one of the other great things about the group aspect is in a single group, you can have someone who finished treatment two weeks ago and someone who's been done for eight years. So that would be me. Yeah. Cause you can't kick me out. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, I mean, I, I still have people in the program that I met in 2009. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, that's one of the biggest benefits is like someone who's just coming out of treatment Mm -hmm. and doesn't really know where to go or what to do or what's going to happen next. They can see what someone who's five years out is capable of. And Mm -hmm. that person also knows what it means from a psychological standpoint to have your six month checkup come up and all the anxiety that comes with that. Oh my goodness. Six months, three months, a year out. It doesn't change. Yeah. Well, Let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. What's one of the hardest things you had to deal with? Because you have people who are coming there to exercise, Mm -hmm. to get better. But some of us, we don't get better. Or we get better, and then some of us are not here anymore. That's, yes. Um, Just dealt with that recently, actually. Uh That part's awful, Mm -hmm. and I have not gotten any better at dealing with it. Yeah. Admittedly, I'm terrible. Um. What I'll say, though, is in 10 and a half years, I've only had to deal with that maybe about five or six times. Mm -hmm. And every one of them is awful and Mm -hmm. it takes me forever to get over it. But I would say those are pretty good odds. And I think a lot of that is reflected in some of the, the numbers you're seeing lately. It's like even though the incidence of cancer is still rising, the yes. the five year survival rate is so high now, mm-hmm. um, and a, a lot of that has to do with advancements in treatment and hopefully people seeking things post treatment, whether yes. it be psychological counseling, exercise, nutrition, mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. So that's, I mean, far and away the worst thing I have to deal with. And this, I will say this. This past year and a half has been particularly rough for some reason. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it. It's not easy, it's right? It's not, no. Because you fall in love with these women, you, or yeah. the patients, or. Um, and we fall in love with DJ. Like when I say DJ, they be like, oh, yeah, DJ. I'm going <laughs> back for DJ. <laughs> that means a lot. <laughs> Hey, whatever it takes to get him back. Whatever it takes to get him back. So we thank your wife for that, for sharing a little bit of you with us. <laughs> and she probably thanks you guys because I've you've helped me grow up a lot. <laughs> oh, I remember when you guys were engaged, when you were dating. Like, that was the benefit of having you there. We could talk about things outside of yeah. what we were going through. We were having conversations outside of cancer. Yeah, I mean, that was... I. Re- <laughs> I remember like when I, when I met Madeline Mm -hmm. getting coached through how to approach dating her and then everyone was very happy for me. And then it was like four years later 
everyone also in full mom mode was like, <laughs> when are you going to Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like get it moving. Uh, she's a lot better than you are. So <laughs> and um, you had plenty of mothers <laughs> yeah. there that were telling you, look, you need to go ahead. It's about time. It's yeah. about time. Yeah. And in the community, we would all talk about it. Yeah. And that had to be a little weird. <laughs> yes. But- You're walking around like, do your sit ups. We're doing sets of this and we're talking about your love life. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, I, it helped because I needed the push clearly, you, but I, I think you're right that, um, not talking about cancer all the time mm-hmm. is in, in, an important aspect of the program. And, um, I, th- I also think some people when they're first starting the program mm-hmm. are a little bit scared of that because they think that's what it is that yes. everything we do everything we talk about is cancer and they're trying to move away from that. Yeah. And once they start, they see that the cancer doesn't really get brought up that often. Um, that's what's amazing about it. Yeah. Because people are trying to, it's a big part of your life that will always be with you, but Mm -hmm. you, it seemed, I, you know, I, from my perspective, you can speak to this. It doesn't seem like people want to acknowledge it all the time. That was me. Yeah. And everybody's like, why do you have a podcast now? Yeah. Because I want to talk about the things that we normally don't talk about. It's not always about cancer. It's about the connection you make yeah. through that. And oh, so DJ's dog <laughs> is giving me a whole lot of love yeah. under the table. She's making herself known. <laughs> so I just want to let you know about that. <laughs> um, but the whole point of um, spending time there for me was working through that because I was a... I was engaged Mm -hmm. um, and then I was diagnosed and then I could barely walk. I could barely breathe. I couldn't even read Mm -hmm. at one point because chemo is serious. And I feel like it has to basically kill you to make you better. Mm -hmm. So you have that fog. So I needed that. And um, going to a place that seems like it's just breast cancer was so much more than that. Right. And then plus y'all had the lovely pink socks that yeah. I will always buy because those things are comfortable. So I wear them every week. <laughs> and I'm not a pink girl, but I will buy those pink socks. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so tell me a little bit, what, how does exercise benefit? Well, where, uh, that's sort of what I'm trying to find out through my thesis right mm-hmm. now that hopefully I'll know a lot more by next May. But some of the things that we've seen are, um, Improvements in fatigue, Mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of times I would say is the biggest complaint that I hear when people are first starting out is that they just feel so run down Mm -hmm. and the things that they used to be able to do fairly easily now seem like when they do that, they're done for the day. Yeah. And when you, when you exercise and you exercise in the right way, Mm -hmm. You, sh- it should actually energize you a little bit. The one thing I tell people when they start out is our goal is to shoot for moderate intensity exercise. Mm-hmm. And the best way that I can describe it is you should leave our building with more energy than you walked in with. And that's true. Yeah. And then you should, it, but it should make you tired that night mm-hmm. so that hopefully you sleep better, you wake up with more energy, and then maybe you get a little bit more out of your workout. And then that cycle sort of builds on itself. Um, And I always say, if you leave this building and you go home and you pass out on your couch for two hours, Mm -hmm. I need to know because that means we're doing too much. Yeah. So it's kind of trying to find that right stimulus. That that balance. My husband always said I was much clearer. Like when I came home, I wasn't in that fog. Mm -hmm. And the next day I was moving much faster, not just in my movements, but in my thoughts. Right. So yep. he was like, clarity was a big thing. And so he was like, go see DJ. Yeah. And I think it's also, um, I don't think exercise has to be something uh, that's seen as this, put on your workout clothes, go to a gym for an hour and you need to be drenched in sweat. Like yeah. it doesn't need to be that intimidating. In fact, one of the things that we focus on a lot in our program is functionality. We yeah. want your, we call them activities of daily living. Yes. We want those to be easier. Mm-hmm. Granted, if you come into the program and you want to run a half marathon, great. I will help you with yes. that. But I, my goal is to get 
your life to be easier and more comfortable and as pain free as we can get it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also a lot of psychological benefits. In fact, it, one of the things that I, I think sort of gets overlooked from people who have maybe not been close to cancer is mm -hmm. that there tends to be this idea where once you finish your treatment, it's like celebration time, which yeah. it is. I mean, you're cancer free, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of pressure for people to, and I've heard this a lot from people in our program who are mothers too. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the spouse and the kids want you to go back to being mom so fast that you feel like you just have to get back into real life. And it's not always that easy. Mm -mm. And it, even if you think about the fact that for however many months your treatment lasted, say it was like four months, for four months you were told what to do, when to do it, where to be, uh -huh. exactly how to handle all these things. And then on the last day, they're like, you're done. You're like, done. That was a big thing for me. See That's you in why six months. Cancer conversation is mm -hmm. or cancer tra transitions. Transitions. That's how I found out about Get Real yeah. and Heal because I was like, I'm done. What do mm -hmm. I do next? You know, you get this nice little um, song, Don't Come Back No More No More yeah. kind of song, and then they give you a certificate. Yeah, you hit the like, gong and you're out. Yeah. Like, what the hell I do next? Yeah, <laughs> You exactly. know what I mean? So coming there, it was like, okay, what's going on? Because once the chemo glow is gone, mm -hmm. once your hair grows back, that's where the name came from. Yeah. Once your skin gets back to its regular color, um, everybody thinks you're fine. Mm, right. But you are not. You are not fine. Yeah. And you're mentally, physically not fine. Right. And everybody wants you to be back. Like there, I've learned that people's lives move on and mm -hmm. yours is still sitting there. Yeah. And that five year or that I'm eight years out now. And the That's first amazing. five years, five years was hell. Yeah. Like, so now I'm just now like, oh, we're in a honeymoon. Oh, we're mm -hmm. kind of doing stuff a little backwards. We're buying our house now. We're having kids now. Yeah, you, you had know? to put everything on hold for so long. Everything was on hold, but nobody else was on hold. Well, and then even, you know, you, know, you finished treatment and then now you're on a new drug for five to 10 years. Yeah, Most good old people 10, 10 years for me yeah. now. And that stuff isn't fun either. Mm -mm. That's, no. you know, people dealing with fatigue and joint pain and just achiness all the time. Yeah. And it's a constant battle that you're dealing with that, like I said, I think the general public who hasn't been really close to it, mm -hmm. they know chemo sucks. Yeah. But then it's like, well, you're done with chemo now. What about the side effects? Yeah. And I, it's also, you're constantly dealing with the side effects from it, mm -hmm. um, whether it's physical or not. Mm -hmm. uh, then you're dealing with the fear where it's every little twinge you feel in your body oh is like, Yes. Oh crap, is that cancer? Yeah, I just called. Like, I, they took me off a of med. I had a holiday for two weeks because mm -hmm. I'm having joint pain, my yep. hip pain. This is pain I've never felt before. Yeah. And they were like, Regina, you're fine. I know. But, but it's where your head goes. Yeah. And then there's like, but we need to do your bone scan. Bone scan. Yeah. I'm only 45. Now I'm doing bone scan. Yeah. And why am I doing a bone scan yeah, if why, I'm fine? If I'm fine, yeah. right? So your, <laughs> your mind is like, what's going on? Okay. Yeah. And just think of someone having to live that. I have a friend right now that she's like, okay, I just was diagnosed. I'm eight months out, mm -hmm. but now this is my life. These checkups. I thought I was done. Yep. Not even close. No. no. And I'm, you know, like I said, it's no fault of their own for yeah. not knowing that, but it's a, I think it's a big part that tends to get overlooked and it's a part of survivorship. Like you'll be a survivor for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and that brings with it a, a lot of challenges. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, that exercise can do mm -hmm. is hopefully for people who need it, give them a, a little bit more of a sense of control and autonomy. Uh -huh. And even, even if it is like just building that strength back up to be able to feel like you can do the things that you need to do. Yeah. It's, it's a sense of control. Like yeah. now I can, I can do the things that I need to do by myself. I don't need anyone's help or guidance. I'm, you know, and it, I think those I goals like, are different for I everyone. I feel too. like myself. Everybody talks about a new norm, but I just want to feel like myself. Yeah, exactly. And I remember w when I got to that point from getting real in hell, I actually 
did a video mm-hmm. going up that hill. I, I remember, remember that. Remember yeah, that? when you left I, that last day. Yeah. I was like so proud of myself, like so yeah. proud of myself. And then when I was pregnant with the girls, I think I worked out more ever. Yeah. Like I was almost eight months before I stopped. Well, I think it's also interesting you use that phrase new normal. Uh-huh. And I think it's not my favorite it's not phrase my favorite. in the world. And it sounded like you weren't into it either. Just yeah. because it... It almost sounds like you're just accepting that you're going to have to feel like crap all the time. And um, I know there's a lot of barriers because making yourself feel better can take a lot of time and money. Like, you know, if you're going to a massage therapist or something because your shoulder's always Mm -hmm. hurting after you've had surgery. Yeah. Um, So I get it. But I, I think new normal just makes it sound like. Okay, just, well, now my baseline's dropped down yeah. all the way here, and I'm just going to have to learn to live with that. Yeah. And in some cases, unfortunately, people do because they might not have the resources. But, you know, for, for people who are able to come into our facility, I feel grateful that they have access to something. And like your program is free, right? Yes, always free. Always free. So, and what are your hours of operations? Right now we're Monday, Wednesday, Thursday uh-huh. from 7 a.m. to noon. Okay. And then we take a little break because uh, school's sort of getting in the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, <laughs> come back from 4.30 p.m. to 6.30. Okay, so that's still a good time for yeah. someone who's getting off of work to get over to your program. Yeah, and they will never pay a dime and they can stay for as long as they want. Like me. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, before we go, I want to talk about the typical, like me coming in, Uh how do I come in and where do I start? When I walk through your doors, what is my experience going to be? So usually when we find out that someone wants to be in the program, they'll Mm -hmm. get referred from, uh, a lot of times it's from a doctor, radiation oncologist, Mm -hmm. their oncologist, um, Sometimes it's from a friend and a lot of times there's nurse navigators, lay navigators that help. Um, were, weren't you a lay navigator? I or? was a lay navigator. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's nice to have those resources out there. People who know about Get Real yeah. and Heal. So when we get a referral, mm-hmm. we'll contact that person and we have them fill out some basic uh, medical history. Mm-hmm. And then on their first day, they come in. Uh, myself or Jean Mm -hmm. will meet with them and we kind of just sit there for 30 minutes and we talk about pretty informally Mm -hmm. um, what's going on. Like what, what was your treatment like? How do you feel now? Mm -hmm. Um, Then we'll formally go through your medical history so we can see what kind of medications you're on, what kind of Mm -hmm. surgery had, um, you know, ask about some things that may not be cancer related. Like, do you have any orthopedic issues, mm-hmm. non-cancer related that could hinder your exercise? Uh, we talk about lymphedema oh. and all, you know, that whole world too, mm-hmm. which I, I won't say too much about because I don't think I can speak intelligently about it. Um, that's like an area of expertise that I only know what I re- can repeat from people who know what they're talking about. So well, I did appreciate that you did ask that question because I have been lymphedema yeah. and the whole time you made sure I wasn't overdoing it or paying attention to how much weight my mind thought I right. could pick up versus yeah. what my arm could. And it, that, a lot of that comes with uh, some body awareness too, mm-hmm. which I think is another good thing about exercise is that it does sort of force you to be a little bit more in tune with your body. So like, yes. maybe you do wake up one day and you notice my arm feels a little bit heavier Mm-hmm. than it did yesterday. Um, and then that's where you can go try and get some help from a lymphedema specialist. Yes. So there are people out there that know what they're doing um, and they're a really good resource to have too. Um, so during that first session, we're just kind of getting to know each other a mm-hmm. little bit. Um, I want to make the program not seem too intimidating. Yes. Because I know a lot of people coming in for the first time may have zero uh, exercise history. Mm-hmm. So my initial goal is make sure they come back yes. a second time because, and we start out really slowly. A lot of that is for safety reasons. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that they can handle the exercise. Okay. I want to see, I just want to get a feel for how they respond to the exercise. So I know how to handle the next session, but ultimately I don't want to do anything that's going to make them think like that was way too much. I'm not coming back here. Yeah. You are, you can exercise pretty hard post cancer, 
but you want to build up to it. And I don't want to scare someone off on the first day with that. So what we'll do is we go through the medical history, try Mm -hmm. and just make them feel comfortable because again, just with that whole cancer world, it's like, okay, now here I am again. It's something new something that new. I've been referred to that I need to do. Mm-hmm. What yeah. are you going to do to me? Yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you asking of me? What do I need to take this off, put this down? Yes. I keep hitting my mic. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, just being comfortable. And I know one of the things you do is, are you still doing like the blood pressure checks before yeah. you start? Yeah, we check. Uh, well, we monitor blood pressure, uh-huh. heart rate, oxygen levels, uh, we try and see how you respond to that post exercise too. Mm-hmm. So we'll check again, see, you know, just make sure everything's okay. And, um, I guess the big thing is trying to let people know that whatever it is, whether you have to travel a lot to get there, yeah. whether you are working too, is that I don't want get real and healed to be another burden on your life. Yeah. So what I tell people, we have some people who drive from Cary and I know that's hard. So what I'll say is if you can't make it three days a week, I don't want this to be something you feel like you have to force yourself to come to so that you're more stressed out. Yes. Well, we could do like come once a week and I'll give you something to do at home. Yeah. On those other days. You guys are on Facebook too, because I see you sometimes post stuff. Yes. On I need, Facebook. You need to get better about that. And exercise routines, because that's how I stay in tune. Yeah. Like, I'm like, and, okay, what's and on there? I think it, it, I think it takes some of the pressure off for some people mm-hmm. too, knowing that I want you to be there three days a week because mm-hmm. we're open three days a week. But I know that real life happens too. Yeah. And I know that you have priorities Mm -hmm. and for a lot of people their priority is spending time with their family Mm -hmm. after all this which yeah absolutely so that's why i don't want i don't want when they when someone comes into the program for them to think god this is just another thing that i have to do add it on to my list yeah i want it to be something that you want to do Mm -hmm. so i i think the the harder actually i don't really find it hard anymore because i've been doing it for so long but the most important thing for me to do is meet everybody where they are. Yes. I can tell usually, and Jean also, because she's been doing it even longer than I have. Yes. We can usually tell within five to 10 min- minutes of talking to someone how much they're going to want to be pushed mm-hmm. from an intensity perspective. So you try and meet them there. Like sometimes you meet some people and they have this crazy exercise history. Yeah. And they do so much. And their concern is that this isn't going to be enough for them. So I've seen that happen. Yeah. And and sometimes they might be right Mm -hmm. because we don't do anything too crazy. Yeah. Uh, But I still want them to be able to benefit from it. So I will modify what I do with them so that it is beneficial to them and also something that they look forward to. Yeah. So we'll start every person. I shouldn't say every person because it's the majority, but we start with a treadmill test mm-hmm. just to get a feel of where you are uh, cardiovascularly. I remember that treadmill yeah. test. I so, actually did it at the somewhere at the hospital or something. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I didn't do it at Get Real and Heal. I had Dr. B and he was like, come up here. And I was oh, like, yeah. okay. <laughs> oh, so you did like the official one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we do that with people. The only time we won't is if they're uncomfortable on a treadmill uh-huh. or maybe have some like knee issues. Mm-hmm. But that's okay because I can still get a feel for where we're going to start from there. Mm -hmm. So we get that just to get an idea. We'll go through a few basic uh, strength exercises, maybe with uh, free weights, body weight, Mm -hmm. bands. And we sort of start with the foundational exercises and see how they respond, see what hurts, Mm -hmm. see what they're okay with. And we just progress from there as the weeks go on. We start adding a little bit more volume. So maybe we're adding more time to the exercise Mm -hmm. session. Maybe we're adding more weight, more reps, more sets, and we respond to each person individually. And I I think that's actually something I should mention about the group exercise. It's, I don't want people to think of that being group exercise is like, it's an aerobics class where I'm at the front of the room with a microphone on and everyone's following. That's not what it is. Yeah. All the group exercise means is that there are multiple people there working out at a time they could be doing completely different things. Yes. We have some people who either can't or choose not to get on the ground. Yeah. So they never get on the ground. Some people can't do a treadmill, don't want to do a treadmill. They'll never touch a treadmill. 
So there's a lot of people there who are going through what you're going through, but you're not going to be required to do anything. And that's what I liked about the group session that we were still individuals. Everybody always still had their chance um, to either do their exercise. And you were really good with saying, okay, I know this person is going to be on that machine Mm -hmm. for the whole entire time. Yep. So I'm going to manage this side of the room to make sure that it's okay. Exactly. Yeah. So I, you know, when we say group, we're talking about, it's a group effort in there, but oh, we're yeah. all doing something different. Yeah. Well, how long does someone actually attend the program? So we call it a 16 week program uh-huh. because that's when we do that initial intake mm-hmm. and that treadmill test. And then we do it again at the end of 16 weeks. However, you can keep coming for as long as you want. After mm-hmm. That's just like a pre and post testing to see improvements. Uh, but after that, you can come forever. It's, <laughs> it's essentially like it's your gym. Yes. Yeah, my membership eight years yeah. free. Like I said, I love I, it. Yeah. I've known people for a decade yeah. now. And um, that, that was the big thing when, when we changed the format in 2013, mm-hmm. the, the thing that Gene and I pushed for so hard it, we were, we basically said, we don't care what happens, yeah. but we have to allow people to continue mm-hmm. after they finish the 16 weeks. And we have to let people who have finished come back Yes, because one of the, the big complaints I was hearing is people would leave the program because at the time it was actually a five month pro you were there for five months, five months. Yeah. Um, and then they would go try and work out at another, uh, corporate gym Yes, and they would email and say, it's not working out. I don't know what to do. And it's not the fault of the trainers in those gyms, Mm -hmm. but a lot of times in a gym, you're not going to find people who have experience working with a clinical population Yeah, and not just clinical, but uh, specifically in a cancer population Mm. because your, the, everything you learn about exercise completely goes out the window Mm -hmm. when you're throwing chemo and radiation and surgery into the mix. Don't forget that lovely medication. And that too. Yeah. (laughs) Even just like, yeah, you're throwing joint pain from medication Mm -hmm. in and then what happens after that? So it's even just having a trainer who knows what it means when you have scarring from radiation Mm -hmm. or burning from radiation. And maybe it hurts for you to do a chest press because when you stretch your chest and pull your arms back, it hurts. Yeah. So I think it's important to have someone who um, understands it because when I went back to the gym, um, you know, when I say I can only lift 10 pounds, I'm like, you can lift more than 10 pounds. Yeah. And I didn't want to get into my medical business right. about it. So I was like, never mind. I'll just go back to get really new. That, okay. That's important yeah. because the one thing I do tell people. So sometimes we have people who are in the program, but since they do live far away, yeah. they, once they finish, they choose not to come back. They're going to go somewhere closer to yes. home. You have to be so proactive with your trainer. Yes. Uh, speaking up, telling them what you can do and what you can't do. Mm-hmm. Any trainer that forces you to do something you say you don't like is an awful trainer. Yes. And I, I think that's a problem we can get into some other time. It's yeah. just people, they they have ways that they like to train. Mm-hmm. so And they kind of force that on everyone else. And when you're working in this population that, like I said, that all goes out the window. That doesn't work. I, I don't even go into work each day with a plan. And that's what I like because it would be useless. Yeah. Because, and it's not, it's not just patient by patient, but like between patients, but Mm -hmm. within patients Mm -hmm. too, you might feel great on Monday and then you come in Wednesday and you know, you're either super fatigued or Maybe you slept funny on that surgery side Mm -hmm. shoulder and now it's hurting a little bit and we're not going to do anything to exacerbate that problem. So I I learned not to go in with a plan years ago because I never stuck to it. So, and that's why you're DJ. (laughs) Well, that's what I tell every, every (laughs) volunteer or student that we Uh have is like, you're nothing if not flexible. Yeah. You have to be able to just change on the fly because don't expect the plan in your head to actually come to fruition. It's not. Yeah. So, and I, I learned that mostly from, um, Dr. B and Jean, uh-huh. um, obviously Dr. B has been doing this mm-hmm. like close to three decades probably now. Uh-huh. And Jean's been doing it a couple of years longer than me. And that was the biggest thing that I took from them is that you were there to meet everyone's individual needs 
and whatever's like blocking that from happening in your head, you need to get rid of because we are here to facilitate what they can and want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not your goals anymore. It's, it's theirs. And those goals are vastly different between, I mean, in the same group, you can have someone who's trying to train for the Tar Heel 10 miler, which is a big race around here. And you might, I had a woman one time came in and she was like, my only goal is when I pick my kids up from school and they ask me to chase them around the building. Yes. I want to be able to do it. And that's a big goal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I was like, if I can facilitate that, then I've done my job. And, and, you, and you do your job so well, well DJ. thank you very much. Well, DJ, is there anything else you would like to share with us today? I would say if, if you are able to uh -huh. and you can do it safely and you feel comfortable working with someone, mm -hmm. exercise is great. Uh -huh. I know and I understand that for some people it's really hard because of the side effects mm -hmm. and I, I'm compassionate with that feeling. So I understand it. I don't think anyone should be forced to do it if they really feel like they can't. Mm -hmm. But I think if you have any ability to try to do anything, walk around your neighborhood for 10 minutes to start mm -hmm. and that'll slowly start to build on itself. And if you have access um, and resources to find a gym or a trainer that can work with you and meet you where you are, mm -hmm. I would advise you to try and do it as much as you can. Because exercise, I've seen it now for a while. Yeah. Uh, I've been studying it for a while and uh -huh. I've really, I've honestly seen it change people's lives. Well, you actually gave me a part of my life back. So I definitely, definitely thank you for that. Don't start crying. No, that's, why I, <laughs> that's why I looked away from you and stopped listening. <laughs> <laughs> so DJ, I want to thank you again for being a guest on my podcast. You made it easy. Fun. Yeah, we're going to do it again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you for listening to Chemo Glow. And um, until next time. Sound editing is provided by Josh Masters. If you like what you hear, please rate and review the podcast in iTunes. Connect with Chemo Glow on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also find more content at chemoglow.com.